Thank you, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's great to be here. Looking forward to chatting a little bit, a little bit about digital pathology this afternoon, including a discussion of pathomics and spatial profiling. With that, uh, let me get my clicker. My disclosures are just with Danaher. So I'd like to uh, kick things off with just a brief introduction to Leica Biosystems. I'm a pathologist by training, and so it's been a, a real pleasure for me to uh, serve as chief medical officer for Leica Biosystems since I started with Danaher a couple years ago. So Leica um, is one of the global leaders in tissue diagnostics, serving anatomic pathology labs and pathologists around the world uh, with a mission shown on the slide of advancing cancer diagnostics and improving lives. And I think that goes for uh, not just Leica Biosystems, but also all of Danaher. Leica is unique as the only global player uh, in this pathology market that's able to address the entire workflow, all of the needs of anatomic pathology labs uh, starting from that point in time when the patient gets the biopsy, all the way through the production of glass slides and digital images. And it's these last three components of the anatomic pathology workflow uh, that I'll, I'll be focusing on today. These are the areas where we see the greatest opportunity at Leica and at Danaher uh, to really come up with novel uh, capabilities and diagnostics that can be shared uh, with our global install base. So moving on to uh, digital pathology and pathomics, I think we're all fami familiar with the expression, a picture says a thousand words, as well as uh, Leonardo uh, da Vinci's uh, masterpiece, The Last Supper. It goes without saying that there's a lot going on in Leonardo's uh, painting uh, from the multitude of uh, different facial expressions and gestures of the participants uh, to the spatial organization of the apostles into three groups of three around Jesus. The same could actually be said of this histopathology picture, in this case an image of an invasive breast carcinoma. Just like the Last Supper, there's a lot going on in this image, at least to us pathologists in, in the audience. You can see the the complete loss of the normal ductal breast architecture. Uh, you can see the tumor cells coursing up through the, the center of the image, uh, surrounding and infiltrating the fat. Uh, and you can see the dense inflammatory infiltrate, uh, particularly in the upper right hand uh, side of the image, suggestive of a, a quite a vigorous immune response to the tumor. I could describe many more features uh, to this tumor uh, in this image, but the point I want to make is there's a tremendous amount of information in this histopathology images, in this histopathology image and similar images uh, that's available uh, for deeper analysis. So what does this have to do with Leica? Well, as I highlighted in that first uh, intro slide to Leica, uh, Leica's involved in turning glass into pixels uh, with a leading portfolio of digital uh, pathology platforms that convert pretty much any glass slide, uh, histopathology slide, into a high resolution di digital image like this one. The high resolution information in these images is really at the core of what's driving this transformation that's happening in pathology from digital to computational pathology. And this has been happening over the last several years. We've got some experts in the audience uh, for any of you who have an opportunity to chat with Andy Beck of Path AI, he's really the expert in this field. Digital pathology itself has unlo unlocked a number uh, of very impactful uh, applications for pathologists, uh, including replacement of the microscope for primary diagnosis, which was obviously critical during COVID. Thanks, Steve, uh, for allowing uh, these digital pathology scanners to be sold and marketed uh, during uh, the emergency use authorization uh, without FDA clearance. That was a huge help and has actually uh, really driven uh, the adoption of digital pathology over, over the last couple of years. But the application of computational approaches on these digital images 
has the capacity uh, to provide even greater diagnostic uh, capabilities going forward, including some of these listed on the left. These include things like tumor detection, tumor subtyping, uh, rare event localization, for example, looking for tiny clusters of tumor cells and lymph nodes, and even prediction of gene mutations in, in lieu of having to do molecular tests. So how do we get to these insights, these, these pathomic insights? Well, one of the first steps is to use computational approaches to extract high-resolution information uh, from these images, so-called pathomic information. So what, are the, what kinds of information are we talking about that can be extracted from pathology images? Well, the answer is that all kinds of information can be extracted from these images, including a variety of morphologic features, including the ones uh, shown on the list. You can extract tumor cell size, nuclear shape, lymphocyte density, on down the list, necrosis, hemorrhage, uh, you name it. These features are very, or these images are very rich in data. And you can think of these morphologic features as analogous to the A's, C's, G's, and T's in the context of DNA and the genetic code. And together they comprise a pathomic code. So then how do these morphologic features unlock pathomic insights, such as microsatellite instability or recurrence risk in the, in the context of breast cancer? Well, in short, uh, these pathology images with the proper annotation of these morphologic uh, characteristics can be trained on a variety of data uh, with AI approaches shown in the middle. This data can, in can include genomic, transcriptomic, outcomes, imaging, uh, you name it. <clears throat> All this training uh, can go into looking for correlations uh, between the morphologic features uh, and these types of data. For example, uh, correlation of nuclear size and shape could be uh, <clears throat> made with, uh, for example, the, the mutation status of a gene like BRAF or the gene fusion status of an ALK uh, along the lines of what we heard about earlier with that soccer player. This training through multiple cycles of testing, retraining, and testing uh, can allow these AI applications to be fine-tuned to then provide these pathomic insights. So what, what's an example of one of these pathomic insights, a real example that's been unlocked by morphologic features uh, with AI? Uh, this is a publication out of the AI company Oaken, uh, who many of you are familiar with. In this study, uh, the investigators identified specific morphologic features that were associated with either complete response or non-complete response of triple negative breast cancer uh, to neoadjuvant uh, chemotherapy. So the upper panel shows some of the features and provides some good examples of what these are um, that were associated with complete response, including the presence of hemorrhage, the presence of necrosis. So those are features that were good to have in the context of this study and, re and response to chemo. The features that were not so good to have are shown in the bottom. Those include fields with fibrosis as well as non-cohesion of the tumor cells. So when the authors uh, looked at these features and trained them across multiple tumors uh, with machine learning approaches, uh, the resulting AI was able, was able to accurately predict uh, these breast cancer patients' likelihood of response uh, to chemotherapy. So that's a, a really good example of what this type of information is doing. So this slide summarizes the many, many clinical applications of AI and pathology based on these pathomic insights. And although we're still in the early days of FDA clearances and approvals for these applications, the main point <coughs> is that over the last several years, the quality of data and the depth of evidence has really increased, which is paving the way uh, for the entry of these applications into the actual uh, clinic. So switching gears, I wanna spend the next uh, few minutes talking about multiplexing and spatial profiling and why it's important in oncology. Um, 
Stated simply, if you look in the upper left, spatial profiling is the visualization of biomarker expression to characterize various cell types and this, their spatial organization in the tumor microenvironment. One can think of spatial assays as a fruit tart relative this, to the smoothie uh, that Reiner mentioned earlier that represents bulk biomarker analyses or the individual fruits representative of single cell analyses. The bottom right image is a, is a good example of a spatial assay, in this case performed on a breast cancer. And when you associate patient outcome data, for example, response to a drug with spatial assays like this one, you can, have, you can <coughs> glean important insights into how the location of tumor cells with respect to the immune cells, the stromal cells, and other cells of the tumor microenvironment can influence cancer behavior and therapeutic response. So what's the current landscape of spatial profiling technologies? Specifically, what approach uh, do we think will be most impactful in the clinical setting as we look ahead at the many new cancer therapeutics entering the clinic? These therapeutics range from immunotherapies like the checkpoint inhibitors to CAR-Ts and multi-specific antibodies, all of which uh, we think uh, require more than one biomarker to likely predict uh, patient response. So at one end of the spectrum, high-plex spatial assays developed by companies like 10x Genomics uh, that many of us are familiar with, they're really good for uh, biomarker discovery and basic research, but they're not at all practical for broad clinical use. And then at the other end of the spectrum, you have low-plex traditional IHC technology along the lines of what Leica uh, has developed, which is great for basic diagnostic applications. But these uh, simple, simple one- and two-plex assays are not sufficient for prediction of response to the many newer cancer therapies that we're talking about. So we've been going around uh, GEMBA visits to uh, multiple academic centers and <clears throat> talking with a lot of our biopharma customers. And based on this feedback, we think the sweet spot uh, for the number of biomarkers needed for patient selection um, for this new class of drugs for response prediction is in that three to six midplex range. And so to this end, last year, Leica acquired a company called Cell IDX, which has a proprietary multiplex technology to move into this midplex space. So what's novel about the Cell IDX technology? Unlike a traditional antibody staining uh, for those who've done in immunohistochemistry uh, in the lab, Cell IDX attaches unique tags to the primary antibodies, which allows for the application as well as the detection of multiple primary antibodies in the same assay when you bring in specialized secondary anti-tag antibodies. And this process greatly reduces the time as well as the number of steps required for multiplexing. As you can see in some of the examples on the right, uh, the technology provides for up to four color chromogenic detection, which is really helpful for standard clinical pathology labs that are used to uh, chromogenic techniques but it also provides for up to sixplex, uh, multiplex uh, fluorescent detection, which starts to get into the upper end of the range that uh, we got feedback on that would be required for this clinical adoption by biopharma. So given the complexity and the lack of automation of other spatial technologies, the Akoyas, the Ultaviews of the world, like a strategy uh, with Cell IDX technology, is to incorporate it into this more simplified staining, imaging, and analysis, analysis workflow that can be easily adopted and performed by lab, labs with Leica platforms, similar to the way they're running uh, immunohistochemistry currently. So very briefly, what are some of the spatial use cases that Leica is developing for the clinic? This slide highlights a couple of those use cases. And without getting into the details, we think that 
developing multiplex panels uh, for uh, tumors like non-small cell lung carcinoma and lymphoma highlighted here uh, with supporting AI can be very impactful uh, for pathologists trying to make difficult diagnoses on these cases. And we are optimistic that these use cases has the ability to facilitate diagnosis as well as driving workflow efficiencies in the clinic in the coming years, which we think will pave the way for biopharma to start to think more uh, seriously ab about adopting uh, these types of approaches uh, for their companion diagnostic applications and, and, and therapeutics. So how is biopharma currently using spatial profiling uh, in clinical trials? We know that biopharma is using a, a lot of spatial profiling in the discovery phase as well as in the translational research phase. Uh, but this uh, slide highlights uh, the fact that there's multiple clinical trials that are using uh, spatial assays uh, to predict therapeutic response uh, at various stages now. One of these clinical trials uh, in the second, uh, the second uh, row uh, by a company called 3D Med uh, is using or employing a 10-plex spatial assay for evaluation of gastric cancers uh, to predict the response to a PD-1 inhibitor. And this is one good example of many that highlights the increasing clinical use uh, by pharma uh, of spatial technology. So then the question comes up, are there any spatial assays that could be approved as companion diagnostics on the horizon? And interestingly, uh, one of the uh, assays uh, listed in that prior table it's called the Onco Signature Test for Acrovon's multi-cancer therapeutic called ACR368. So this is a three-plex assay uh, that predicts response to the drug and is being assessed currently in a phase two clinical trial for patients with uh, three different kinds of cancer, ovarian, endometrial, uh, and urothelial. And interestingly, uh, this assay is actually utilizing one of Leica's instruments, the Bond RX that you can see there on the left, along with Akoya's imaging uh, and analysis platform. And if this drug actually gets approved uh, in the next couple of years, uh, this uh, oncosignature test could be the first FDA-approved uh, companion diagnostic using spatial technology. So what are the key drivers for adoption of spatial uh, in the clinic? We think the path for spatial to enter the clinic involves continued biopharma use in clinical trials along the lines of what Acrovon is doing with the oncosignature test, along with development of spatial uh, scalable solutions for the clinic uh, that can uh, be integrated into clinical workflows, including reagents, platforms, and AI along the lines of what Leica is doing with Cell IDX. So just a few final thoughts on how Leica, will, uh, Leica is planning to bring pathomics and spatial to the pathology lab. We're currently in the process of bringing together our state-of-the-art platforms as well as reagents uh, with select AI uh, applications of some of the leading AI uh, players in the field into a comprehensive computational pathology platform shown in the upper, in the middle of the upper uh, <coughs> image. We think that by bringing these together in a comprehensive way, that we have ability to make high resolution diagnostics available to our global customer base and pathologists and clinical labs around the world to bring them into this next generation of pathology. So